Balls in San Francisco. Hi, this is my first post, but I've been reading stories here for almost two months now. I hope this fits here. This happened in the summer of 2013. It was mid-August. My family and I traveled to the U.S. to visit California. After leaving Los Angeles, our next stop was SF San Francisco. We were kind of having a road trip. We spent five days in the city, and the third day will forever stay in my mind. Our first day in SF was pretty ordinary. The city was surprisingly cold. We weren't expecting those temperatures in August, to be honest, especially in California. After settling in a hotel, we decided to walk around Fisherman's Wharf. Fisherman's Wharf was a pretty crowded place. I suppose it still is. We walked around for a while, from a museum full of arcades, which name I cannot remember, to Pierre 39. That is where we saw balls for the first time. Now, SF has a surprisingly big population of homeless people, or at least I th it did in 2013. Balls was one of them. He was old and dark-skinned and walked with a limp. He followed us around Pierre 39. I do not think he realized that we knew. We tried to ignore the fact that we were being followed, because we really wanted to enjoy our vacation. It started getting dark, and we were really tired about a six-hour drive from LA to SF, and we have been walking a lot. We went to our hotel that night and tried not to think about balls. The next day, we went to the Golden Gate. We crossed the Sausalito and explored the little town. Around 3 p.m., we decided to go back to Pier 39. We wanted to finish our walk there. Once we arrived, we looked around to see if Balls was there. To our relief, he wasn't. Or at least is what we thought. We walked for about two hours until we had seen everything that we wanted to see. We were leaving Pier 39 when out of nowhere, Balls walks in front of us. He was wearing some sort of old trench coat. He was looking at us with hatred. We left as quickly as we could and drove to Twin Peaks. We would see Balls one last time. On our third day in SF, we had to go back to Fisherman's Wharf even if we did not want to. We wanted to go to Alcatraz, and the only way of buying the tickets is going near Pierre 39. Sadly, we were not able to buy the tickets, and we had lost a lot of time. We didn't have plans for the day, and we were hungry, so we walked to the part of Fisherman's Wharf where they sell seafood. When we were trying to choose what to eat, my father's shoulder was grabbed, balls, wearing his filthy trench coats, was standing right there. Now, he had pigtails and a lot of makeup. With a raspy voice, he said, Do you speak Spanish? In Spanish. We do. My father, being scared, started saying random stuff in Italian and French, and pushed us to walk away. This time, Balls followed us very close, asking us questions. We were looking for a police officer when, disgustingly, Balls took off his trench coat. He was wearing a mini skirt, and you could see his balls. He was trying to grab my father again, but he couldn't. A police officer was close. I think that Balls was scared of the police because he ran as fast as he could with his balls flapping. We never returned to Fisherman's Wharf and we never saw balls or his balls again. So balls, let's not meet again. I told a serial killer to fuck off. In 2006, I was a college student in ASU. I lived in an off-campus apartment on the ground floor, and it was a block off a major street here in Phoenix called Baseline. These details are important. In the summer of 2006, Phoenix, Arizona was plagued by two serial killers. One was the Phoenix Shooter, who ended up being a team of two guys randomly shooting people and the other was the baseline killer, a rapist and murderer. Having two serial killers put the entire city on edge, and everyone was talking about it. I even saw articles in Time or Newsweek about the situation. So, the fall of 2006 semester had just started. Now you may have heard this, but Phoenix is hot in August. It would get stuffy in my apartment, so I'd leave the window cracked a little because the morning air is nice. The blinds provide visual cover. Anyways. One morning, a strange sound woke me up. It was the crack of dawn, 4.45 a.m., and the sun was just barely coming up. It was the sound of someone lightly tapping on the window, and it seemed intentional. In my tired state, I figured it could be a bird or some branches or, some, or something trivial. Tap, tap, tap. Silence. After about 90 seconds of nothing, 
The tapping returned, and it was absolutely purposeful. I was positive of a human producing the sound. I thought it was my boyfriend, who thought it was cute to try and scare me sometimes. I decided I'd be a bit of a brat and make him wait, but I was also getting really angry. How dare he pull a prank when I'm trying to sleep? This is just like him. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind about disturbing my sleep like this tap 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 tap. At a certain point, I got up to get a glass of water, still being in the mindset of wanting to annoy my stupid boyfriend who thought this would be funny. But I saw some movement through the slits in the blinds, and I marched over and yanked the blinds so I could see definitely not my boyfriend. I said very loudly, what the fuck? He sort of seemed taken aback by my anger, but only slightly. The man I saw will be forever with me, or more specifically, his eyes and the feeling they gave were insanely creepy. Honestly, words can't do justice on how terrifying his eyes were. They looked like black orbs with no white in them. Absolutely predatory. When I see pictures of Ted Bundy or Charles Manson, that's, that's exactly what he looked like. Even if you saw a picture of how they looked, it's different when you experience it in person. It totally floored me. Something about this man was profoundly wrong. He was crouched down, like an umpire, and he had dark pants on, a dark purple shirt, and a dark Nike hat. He had dark skin, I thought he was Hispanic, but I later found out he was only a light-skinned black guy. Anyways, after I yelled what the fuck at him, he whispered to me, Can I talk to you? If you want to know how insanely creepy that is to hear, just whisper that sentence out loud to yourself right now. It sends chills down my spine when I think of how that sounded. His hand slowly moved towards his waist. I later learned he would blitz attack his victims, and he probably had a gun. All that separated us was a mesh screen. Now, this is about a three second interaction at this point. For some reason, I thought of Ted Bundy and how he pretended to be crippled to target his victims. I thought of my mom telling me not to be nice to strangers. Don't, don't be afraid, don't be afraid to be a bitch. My thinking wasn't as calculated as all that, but it was more the nano processing of how to deal with the situation. So when he whispered that, I started yelling at him, hell no, get the fuck out of here, douchebag. I shut the window angrily and locked it. I can't overemphasize how incredibly irritated I was that this person had the audacity to disturb my precious sleep. I lay back down and wondered if I'd been too mean. What if he needed help? But that didn't really make sense. Why would he be like tapping and whispering if he was truly in trouble? I decided he was a creep after all. I was too annoyed to go back to sleep, but I sort of laid back down. I told my roommates about an hour later, and she sort of jokingly asked if it could have been the baseline killer. When she said that, my heart sank. His face looked exactly like it did in the police sketches that were on billboards everywhere. The only problem is that those billboards showed him with dreads, and the man at my window had no dreads. Apparently, he was some sort of disguised artist who'd wear wigs. I called the Phoenix police, and the detective I talked to agreed that it sounded like his M.O. The suspect would say something to throw off his target, and then he'd blitz attack. The detective said that my angry response probably made me seem too much of a hassle and he moved on. The only problem was that I thought the guy looked Hispanic and the detective said many witnesses described him as black. I thought they might want to come out and try for samples or surveillance video or something, but I didn't hear back again from the detective. My parents freaked out. They got us knives, pepper spray, and put up signs. We learned another tenant had to complain the same morning. I never learned the details, but this idiot was apparently going around the damn complex, trying to find a target. The stupid apartment wouldn't let us out of our lease, so we moved to a two-floor apartment right above our old units. Anyways, on September 4, 2006, they arrested Margadou. I think the detective didn't call me back because they were days away from arresting Gadou. When I saw his mugshot, I was sick but also relieved. He was absolutely the guy outside my window. To me, he looked like he could be Hispanic. You can judge for yourself if you Google it. He's on death row in Arizona now. His wife tried to mount some campaign to show that the police were framing him or something like that. On a personal level, it certainly would make for an interesting coincidence if this poor, innocent man who they framed was also whispering like a creep and tapping my window. The other cool thing about this story is that I had a really bad eating disorder at the time, and about 8 months after this happened, I got into solid recovery. I never would have experienced how wonderful life could be 
If the slightest thing would have changed that morning in 2006, I can't think of something more scary than a serial killer tapping on your window. That actually happened to me, and if it happens to you, just scare them right back. Don't be afraid to be downright rude to someone who's injecting themselves into your space. It could save your life if you're not afraid to throw your weight around and tell someone off, trust yourself. You can still be a kind and generous person and still tell someone to fuck off. Can we get a ride? This happened in my early 20s, about 10 years ago, and it still makes my skin crawl to think of what might have happened to me. Around 10.30 on a summer evening, I was driving home from my boyfriend's house and stopped to grab something to eat from a fast food joint. I also ordered a hamburger patty for my dog, who was in the back seat of my car. The street I need to turn left on to go home is busy, and there is no stoplight. While waiting, I'm eating some food with my window half down, enjoying the nice weather. Then I hear someone say something to my left, and see a group of four guys about a block away, walking in my direction down the sidewalk. Since my radio was on, I didn't hear what they said, and I stupidly turned it down and said, What? One of the guys in front says something, but I again miss what he's saying. I glance back at the streets, and we see a wall of traffic both ways, unable to turn, and consider turning right instead so I can just leave. The guy speaks again, and this time I heard him. Hey, can we get a ride? Uh, no, I stammered out. This isn't good. They're about 10 feet away from my car at this point, and I start rolling up my window while glancing between the guys in traffic, still no openings. My window almost up, maybe a couple inches left and I decide to back up into the parking lot and leave via an exit that leads through a neighborhood. I put my car into reverse right as the guy who asked for a ride gets to my door. He sidles up to the door, leans heavily against it, and asks again if he and his friends can get a ride. The way he was asking wasn't right, and his friends walked up pretty close behind him. The next bit happened so fast, but felt like minutes went by. I took my foot off the brake to start reversing back into the parking lot because my brain was screaming at me to leave immediately. Rightfully so, because as I said nope and start to roll backwards, he tries to open my car door. I can still remember the thud sound of the handle snapping back down. Suddenly my dog, who had previously been enjoying his hamburger and oblivious to what was happening, jumped out and started throwing himself and bouncing off the window barking and snarling. The guy at the door put his hand up and said, Oh, I didn't know you had a dog, as he and his friends quickly backed away, as I forded backwards with my heart in my throat. I didn't know my way through the neighborhood exit well, but I just kept driving and turning down streets until I figured out where I was. Once I got home, and was safely in my garage with the door shut, I realized how much I was shaking. No idea what those guys wanted to do, but I'm very glad I didn't find out. I'm so thankful my dog lost his shit and provided enough of a surprise and distraction for me to get out of there, and also to my mom for teaching me to always keep my car doors locked. The Red Coat this happened to me four years ago when I was 15. I am female, by the way. I don't know if this is the right place for my story, but I would give this sub a try. I've been lurking for a couple weeks. So, when I was 15, my grandpa died mid-August. He lived in Sterling, MA, so my mom took a week off work to go up there. It wasn't until a little later that I was able to get away from school for a weekend to go with my mom again and visit the actual grave. I remember the Saturday of that week, I walked up to the graveyard where he was buried. It was only a mile or so from my grandma's house, and it was quaint. Only about 30 or 40 locals were buried there. I get to the graveyard and I walk over to my grandpa's grave, when I noticed a tall boy who looked to be around my age, maybe a year or two older. When he noticed me, I gave a quick wave, and to my surprise, he walked over to me. As he got closer, I noticed he was carrying what seemed like a blank canvas, 
which I thought was odd, because I could tell he didn't have any supplies with him, but brushed it off. Thinking back on it now, I remember his clothes looked something a 60-year-old man might donate to a Goodwill, but they fit him well. He struck up a friendly conversation and told me he lived nearby just up the hill, and after a couple minutes he left. After that I stayed a little longer, and then decided I should head home. Over dinner that evening, I remember asking my grandma about the boy, but she said that the house up the hill had been vacant for years. I remember thinking she was going insane, because I clearly saw the boy, but I just let it slide because she was obviously going through a tough time. So the next day was my mom and I's departure day. I think it was a Sunday. My grandma surprised me with this really nice red coat as an early Christmas present, because we wouldn't be coming back until very later. I wore the coat to go visit my grandpa's grave one last time. I get down and say my final goodbyes when I remember hearing something in the woods and getting really creeped out. I heard the rustling again and decided to leave. I never saw that boy again despite my many visits to my grandpa's grave since. I kind of forgot about him after that. Okay, now fast forward four years. About a week or two ago, I was at a flea market with my friend. She wandered off and I was, I was browsing alone when I came across something that caught my eye. It was a painting on its side that looked oddly familiar. I picked it up and turned it upright. It was a painting of me at my grandpa's grave. It looked as if whoever painted it was looking from afar because of a full landscape drawing with me standing in my red coat in the corner. I got a vivid memory of the boy holding on to the blank canvas and I've come to the conclusion that he must have been the one to paint this. How I got to Connecticut from Mass, I will never know. And that fact totally creeps me out. Like, what are the chances of me finding it? There were no dates or names on the canvas, though. It was for sure the same graveyard my grandpa is at. I could tell by the layout. And the fact that I was in it. I didn't buy it, though, because I was way too freaked out. I just put it down and left. I haven't told anyone about it. And I still have that red coat. Footsteps. This happened around August last year. My girlfriend and I were 18 years old. I'm a huge fan of this subreddit and today, Sully remembered this night and thought I'd share it. So, a little context. Had been with my girlfriend for two years. This was a couple days after the anniversary. We were on holiday with my parents, my sister, and another family, friends of ours. We were staying in a huge barn conversation cottage type place which slept eight. But since the other family's son had also brought his girlfriend along, and there were only eight beds in four rooms, we were two beds short. So, I brought my tent, and we decided my girlfriend and I would sleep in the tent for half the holiday, and then swap with the other couple. Anyways, we were in a lovely, pretty part of Devon, Western England for those who aren't familiar, and there were a few other houses in the immediate vicinity. We pitched our tent in the garden, which was a bit out of view of the house. The garden had a gate leading out onto a footpath through a massive field, which I think led down to the water. One night, we finished our lovely dinner with everyone in the house, and at about half ten or so, we said goodnight and headed out of our tent. It was, it was a nice night. We were comfortable in our tents and perfectly happy with the sleeping situation, for now. At about half past midnight, my girlfriend is asleep. I get out of the tent, put my slippers on, and walk back to the house to use the bathroom. The security light comes on as I approach the house. I open the door. They left it unlocked for us. Go inside and close it firmly. I go to the bathroom, do my stuff, when all of a sudden I hear a click and a creak, like a door opening. On my way back, I stop. The door is open and the security lights are back on. What the fuck? I take a quick look around the ground floor of the house. Nothing seems out of place. So, a bit scared, I head back to the tent. I come back to the tent and my girlfriend is wide awake, and she looks a bit shaken. She tells me she saw the security light come on, and heard three sets of footsteps in the grass walk up to the tent, and stop, followed by what sounded like someone touching the outer sheet. She tells me that through the small gap that was in the tent door, she saw white trouser legs walking past our tent, towards the gate leading out into the field. Now, 
We're both pretty fucking terrified. I tell her about the door opening and the light coming back on. We stay awake probably for about another hour, but then we fell asleep again. At about 3 a.m., I, I wake up. There they are. The footsteps. Three sets of them, approaching the tent, this time from the direction of the garden gate. I go to wake up my girlfriend, but she's already awake. She hears them too. We are utterly petrified now. It's hard to feel more vulnerable than you are when you're practically naked in a small tent in the middle of the night. The three people walk up to our tent, then just like before, they stop. I hear what sounds like whispers. What was probably a few seconds felt like an hour. As we just sat there, frozen with fear, holding our breaths, I honestly felt like any second now, the door would unzip and we would be murdered right then and there. Thankfully, the sound on the feet on grass changes to a crunching of gravel as the glare of the security light shines through once again. Eventually, I mustered up the courage to get dressed and go outside with a torch looking for them. But by then, it was too late. There was no sign of anyone anywhere. We didn't get much sleep that night. The following evening over dinner, we told everyone what had happened. And although they claimed to think we were joking and trying to scare the other couple, the next night, it was their turn to sleep in the tent, and when it was, they backed out and opted to sleep in the lounge. What if he gets in the house? This happened several years ago in the summer, when I was about 11 years old. My dad still had visitation with me and my younger siblings on an every other weekend basis, and this occurred on one of those weekends. A little background. Around the time that we moved to town I live in now, I was about four years old, and my dad had this friend named Tim. Tim runs his own locksmith business, and was the brother-in-law of our landlord. He was a frequent visitor at my house, drinking a few beers with my dad and discussing politics or whatever. My mom never liked him being there because he creeps her out, and I agree with her. Tim was always trying to be really friendly with me, bordering on just plain creepy. He was always to try to talk to me, asking me what kind of things I liked, what I do at school, and etc. I am pretty introverted as it is, so I don't usually answer too much, and I try to make myself as scarce as possible when he was around. Tim is one of those guys that makes an effort to have as much physical contact with someone as possible, and I was not an exception to this rule. He was always trying to tickle me or mess with my hair, which was extremely long at the time, poke me, touch my arm, or try to get me to sit on his lap. I was the only one he did this to. I had a younger brother and eventually a younger sister, but he did none of these things to them. There were other things too that he did that really creeped me out. He lived just around the corner from the elementary school I went to, and the playground was close enough to the road that if you drove by, you could see who was out there and recognize them. Tim used to drive a motorcycle and also had a truck for his business. I recall him driving by the playground very slowly every other day or so, at the exact same time that I had recess. If he was in his truck, he would roll down the window and wave, and I pretend I hadn't seen him. The same went for his motorcycle. Fast forward to when I was 11 years old. This, th this particular incident happened, happened in August of that year, not too long after I had turned 11. I was particularly paranoid at this point due to another incident that had occurred just several weeks before. It must have been a Saturday, because typically the routine on the weekends was that my younger brother, he was about 8 years old at this time, would leave with my dad in the morning. they go up the road to the movie store and rent some video games for the week, and then get some pizza for lunch. This process usually took about 30 to 45 minutes. On that particular day, I had opted to stay at the house. My younger sister was with my mom, so I'd be there myself. This usually wasn't a big deal, because the town we lived in was pretty quiet with the exception of the occasional meth bust or domestic disputes. I was still pretty paranoid though, and spent about 10 minutes going around the house, making sure all the doors and windows were locked. When that was done, I went to the kitchen to get a can of Mountain Dew, and then returned to the living room to watch TV. About the time that I was walking down the hallway, 
I heard Tim's motorcycle pull up. As I said before, this guy really creeped me out, so I stopped dead in my tracks, turned around, and went back up the hallway. At the end of the hallway was a little QB between where the bathroom and my dad's bedroom was. If you sat or stood in the QB, you couldn't be seen from the living room or from the patio off the kitchen. I figured it wouldn't be long before he left once he discovered that no one was home. Now, the doorbell rang a couple times, he knocked on the door, and then there was silence. I was waiting for the sound of his motorcycle to give me the all clear when I heard the noise of a doorknob being jiggled back and forth. Tim was messing with the door to the house from the garage. My heart sank. I realized my dad must have left the garage door open and Tim had invited himself in. He was being rather forceful with the door as if he was trying to force it open. It was locked. At this point, I was very, very freaked out and I could feel adrenaline pumping through my body. I snuck into the kitchen. My dad had a set of huge kitchen knives, like you see on a cooking show. I grabbed one out of the knife holder, and I'd say the blade on this thing was probably 8 or 9 inches, a butcher knife essentially. I returned to my spot in the QB. The sound of the jingling stopped, and I thought for sure that the next thing I was going to hear was the sound of Tim's motorcycle pulling away. Several minutes passed, and I didn't hear it. I didn't hear anything. Then, I I noticed a shadow cast across the dining room next to me. I took a quick glance and began contemplating, disobeying my dad and entering his room for his handgun. The screen door on the patio didn't have a working lock on it, so Tim had yet again invited himself inside the patio. He was standing at the big glass sliding doors looking inside, again messing with the handle trying to get it to open. At that moment, I was praying desperately that Tim did not get into the house. The glass patio door also had a malfunctioning lock on it that every once in a while, with enough force, would come loose and the door would open. All I could think about was what would happen if he got in and found me there by myself? What if he already knew I was there by myself? Even with the knife, how was I going to defend myself against him if necessary? Now, Tim is pretty built and I was a scrawny 11 year old stick at the time. I started crying. I closed my eyes and waited. I don't know exactly what I was waiting for. The sound of the door sliding open? The sound of his motorcycle as he pulled away? The sound of my dad's car as he pulled in the garage? Several minutes went by. Then I heard the sound of Tim's motorcycle pulling away. Relief washed over me and I realized then I had been holding my breath. I stood up and the phone rang. I didn't recognize the phone number. The answering machine picked it up. It was Tim. He was addressing my dad in his message. I just drove by your house and noticed you left your garage door up. Just thought you should know. Call me back when you get a chance. My dad and brother got home several minutes later. My dad listened to the message. Then he looked at me and asked, Did Tim stop by here? I shook my head no. He nodded and added that if he ever did, I had his permission to let him in. So locksmith Tim, let us never, ever, ever meet again. Numbers. This is a story I was talking about with a redditor I met over a post on reddit glitch in the matrix. This story doesn't qualify for that, and that is kind of paranormal, and this was just some creepy person that did something very creepy, and I still don't know who did it or why. This happened about, this happened about 15 years ago. I had just graduated college and just gotten married to my first wife. I had a job right out of college. She was struggling. After a few months, she got a job about 80 miles away. We agreed to split the difference and live in between, so we'd each have a 40 minute daily commute. I don't know, ish. The town that felt right in the middle of the map wasn't a bad place, but it wasn't great either. And being fresh college graduates and newlyweds, we didn't have a lot of money. We settled on a very cheap town home in a four town home building. 
in a tennis year development filled with these cheap track town homes. Basically, we shared with three other poor families. There was some crime, but not enough to have bars on the windows, but enough that the doors had double locks and a chain. One of our neighbors had a three-year-old autistic toddler single mom, who was doing an amazing job supporting him on her own as a full-time waitress. We helped her out from time to time, and we watched her son. He was extremely interesting to play with. Everything was always cleaned up meticulously. He was fascinated by video games in particular. He rarely talked and seemed content to be by himself. Across the street lived a hoodlum, an 11-year-old kid with a bad streak, another single mom. The kid slashed tires, including ours, all over the neighborhood, tried to set a fire to some leaves on the sidewalk, in addition to other things like throwing eggs at windows. He was a little terror. This particular incident takes place almost a year after he moved there and near the autistic boy's fourth birthday on a nice, hot August night. We always locked our doors, but never locked the chain. My ex-wife had fire fears that she wouldn't be able to get out in time if there was a fire. The upstairs windows were wide open to try to get some fresh air in. My wife was into scrapbooking and had left piles of pictures and scrapbooking materials scattered about the living room and coffee table. I went to bed around 10 p.m. after locking the door. She said she went to bed around midnight. In the morning, I got up at 6 a.m. as usual and headed to the kitchen to make myself something to eat. That's when I saw the living room. The scrapbooking stuff that had been put in neat straight piles on the coffee table. The pictures were all stacked neatly with the exception of 16 pictures that were laid out in a grid on the living room carpet, face side down. I didn't pay much attention to it, I was just happy it was clean mostly. My ex-wife was notoriously sloppy and left messes all around. I was always on her to clean up after herself. A couple hours later she gets up and thanks me for cleaning up her scrapbook and I'm like no thank you, I did not do it. She didn't either. We started getting freaked out. We go out there, and that's when I noticed that each upside down picture in the grid has 16 numbers written on the back of it, also in a grid. The 16 numbers on each picture differed. 17, 24, 32, 41, 54, 34, 12, 66, 34, 56, 16, 43, 44, 94, 29, 11. These were all two digit numbers. They weren't in my wife's handwriting. If if looked, if anything, like a neat printed font, but they were clearly done in pen from her scrapbooking supplies. We checked the door, it was unlocked. The windows were still open, but seemed untampered with. I was sure I locked the door in the night, but I couldn't remember. My ex-wife started freaking out, insisted that I was playing a joke on her, or I should call the cops, so I called the cops. The cops came about 30 minutes later. They looked around, had us take inventory. As far as we could tell, nothing had been taken, nothing had been damaged. They couldn't help us, and were pretty useless. They gave us the user chain lock and we'll patrol tonight if we see anything, speech. We locked the chain that night and every night until we moved about three months later. And my wife was speculating about who or why could have done this. I still to this day think it was somehow the autistic four-year-old. Yes, he was small and young, but exceptionally bright. He'd been over to our place before. How he got in or why he did that is anyone's guess. His mom said she would know if he ever left. She'd have freaked out. The hoodlum kid could have done it as well, but he was more of a vandal. There were other creepy, strange, and or meth-addicted people in that area. We just, we just never knew. My ex-wife never felt safe and insisted we move, which we ended up doing. She ended up shredding the pictures. The numbers just freaked her out too much. Whoever wrote those numbers and why is still a mystery I sometimes wonder about. Whoever it is, I hope I never meet them again. Strange events in the night, late in the hood. In August 2014 of this year, I moved to a certain town in East Texas to go to grad school. Due to money issues, 
I had to live in a very diverse neighborhood, if you wish, on the lower end of the monetary spectrum. This didn't faze me because I am a large man, about 260 pounds of muscle and 6'2 I body build. I look intimidating if I want to. Well, I found out real quick, no matter how bad you think you are, there's weird things that can unnerve you. I noticed right away my hood was a dump. In the day, kids were running around climbing up trees, yelling and screaming with no supervision. Shirtless wasters drinking beer in front of their doors, rap music blaring, speaking in a level of ebonics that barely sounded like English. Since I'm white, everyone asked me if I got a dollar or I got a smoke, but it just seemed like typical stuff. I'm no stranger to life in the hood having lived in Chicago, Brooklyn, and other places harder than this. At night, obvious drug deals went down constantly, and random people walking by asked me if I knew where to score coke or pills since I was a white boy who looked hard standing in the hood smoking. Anyways, I have insomnia. Bad. Always have had it. And so I stayed up late, sometimes until sunrise. It's always been the case for me. My first week was uneventful, and I rarely went outside except to smoke. One night, however, I started encountering some really weird shit. I was outside smoking a cig, and it was around 1am in the morning. Cars would pull up slowly, a light to a smartphone would flash on, and a kid would run out from an apartment, get in, then get out. Obvious drug deal of some kind. This didn't bother me, because I mind my own business. Whatever people do to themselves isn't my concern. A few clandestine drug deals went down, and then, and then, around maybe 2am, while I was on the phone, I noticed something out the corner of my eye. Something moving in the dark. Whoa! I say compulsively, and flash my face to the left. Something is moving, and walks out of my view and behind the apartment complex. I go back to my conversation with a prospective girl. And maybe 15 minutes later, I notice movement from the left again. I flash my face left again, alarmed. I catch a better glimpse of the form this time. A man walking in the dark, the pitch dark. No flashlight, no phone, saying nothing. Okay. Weird, I thought, but I, I ignored it. Roughly 20 minutes later, I notice movements again. Same guy. Again. That was enough to make me go back inside. Why some guy is circling the lot outside the apartment complex in total silence, in pitch black, for no reason apparently, is not something I wish to find out the reason for. I go inside, finish my conversation, and an hour later, step back outside to have a smoke. A few minutes later, you guessed it, guy was still circling around in laps for no apparent reason. I finished my smoke quickly, and got the hell back inside and just went to bed after locking my door thoroughly. Well, the guy pacing around at that one night was gone the next few nights, and aside from the stream of drug deals going down, nothing else happened. One night I go late at night for a smoke, and I sit down and pull up my phone to talk, and which I always do. About a half hour in, I hear something strange, like, like, like a moaning noise. I end my conversation and sit and listen. It sounds kind of like a zombie. My blood ran cold. Images of the guy pacing in the dark popped in my head. I never mess with people if I don't have to, but this sounded like someone who was drugged, being raped, or someone who's intoxicated, and they're laying in the road and dying. Something weird was going on, so I called the cops while I waited for them. The noise got louder and closer, and despite my large size, I was very unnerved. It just did not sound normal. The police get there and ask me what is going on, and I explain. And as we are talking, I start to feel weird because the noise had been silent for quite some time. After we speak, girl rips through the silent neighborhood night air, and both cops pull their guns and look at me. Go inside. We'll figure out what the hell is going on. The cops started walking towards the direction in which the sound came from, flashlights and guns ready. I watched from inside the blinds as the police walked around the corner and looked all over, knocking on doors, waking people up, checking to see if people were okay inside their houses. An hour later, the police knock on my door and say they could not locate the sound or the source of the noise. 
They told me if I hear it again, call them. That was the creepiest thing of all. The sound never came back. I don't think they wanted to teach me Hungarian. I have wanted to share this here for a while, but was unsure how to begin this. All I can say is relax and tuck in because this is long, long and horrifying, and changed my perception of whether I was invincible. I was 22 when I first moved to Europe. A stint in Paris led to a transfer to Budapest. I was pretty excited for this and threw myself into the move. Once there, I didn't have an awful lot of support from my company, and I had to look for a flat myself. Not knowing the local language nor areas, I was directed to a few websites for searching for flats and being 22, I wanted to have fabulous clothing. I wanted something frugal but nice. I found a flat in the 8th district. No one told me that this was perhaps not the best area for people let alone foreigners. I went out there in the daytime, and while it was a good 2km or so from the metro station to the apartment building, the road was quiet, leafy, and residential. I didn't think it was a bad part of town at all. For those who have been to Budapest, I think in the back end of the 8th, near Stanenok, which is now Frenik Puska Station, this is remarkably close to the Kaledi Railway. On my bike, it was only 20 or so minutes to work every single day with a bike path, so it seemed like a real dream. Sure, it was a tiny studio, but it was a steal of a price with utilities built in. I was jazzled. I took it without looking anywhere else. Nothing really happened the first few weeks. I moved in towards the end of August when nights were still relatively long, and being new to the city, I was always home before dark. It was after living there that I realized that the street I walked down, Cesado's UT, didn't have many, if any, lights on it, especially when you got further down towards my neck of the streets. The street had quite a bit of construction and new buildings on it, so this has probably since been rectified, but at the time, it was just being gentrified. Anyways, as I adjusted to Budapest, I made friends and started going out, but I was pretty much always on my bike to and from the city. Then I got asked out on a date, this was mid-October, and not wanting to ruin my hair and wear a small skirt, I opted to take the metro into town. The date went okay, and I was on my way back around 10pm. October and BP can be chilly, so I was wearing a really nice, thick overcoat that came to my mid-thigh and black warm tights. I also had a scarf on. All in all, when dressed up, I looked a little bulked up because the coat was made of really good wool but I was clearly a girl. I stepped out of the metro, crossed the road, and headed down my familiar walk home. It was pitch black. New moon, maybe. But whatever, no big deal. Budapest is a super safe city. I got my phone out and had my keys threaded through my hand, so everything was a-okay, I felt. No one else was on the street. A car whizzed by me. Now, here we need some backstory. There are two roads before you can turn on one road to my building. The building I lived on was accessible from either Cyprus Utka or a small little alley that cut in between it and Tissus. The alley was really well lit from the building and the construction. The blocks in Hungary are quite long. Right up with Tissus was a little street to the other direction across the road that had an alley before opening up to a penny market. From the penny market, it opened into a parking lot and then a good bit of way to a petrol station and a super busy big street called Hungaria Koret. Distance from the penny market to the petrol station is a good mile, and the alley itself is very dark and tree-leafed. Anyways, I am so close to home, when another car comes by. I'm a little more than halfway to my home, just past the penny market alley, and another two or three minutes and I'd be inside and warm. The car, however, stopped. He was stopped a little bit between the alley to my house and the other turnoff. Light stayed on, car rumbling but parked. I cannot describe the dread I felt. My heart seized up. I, I immediately stopped walking. It was like my body knew something was wrong. My legs wouldn't work and I felt my mouth go dry. 
Here was the weird impasse. This nondescript car stopped in the middle of the one-way street and me, stopped between it and another road. I could see, behind the lights of the metro station, but it was far away and, and no way could I run there before the car could catch up to me, even going in reverse motion. The penny market was closed. It seriously felt like minutes while we stopped, both of us stopped. Maybe it was. I just knew walking forward was not an option. I then thought, okay, it is a dark road. Maybe they're having trouble seeing the street sign. Regardless, I knew it was wrong. So I made a resolve to cross the road, go to the alley. And as soon as I broke through there, I'd be at a 24 hour petrol stop, no problem. I walked backwards, keeping an eye on the car with purpose in my stride, as if to say I wasn't scared. Spoiler alert, I don't think running a marathon in high heat could produce such a high heart rate as I said. Two steps into it, the car started to slowly back up and I knew this was not good. So I panicked, hobbled across the street. That's when the passenger door opened and a man who looked like Shrek and Hulk's love child stepped out. We're talking bulked out. He was big, beefy, and I'd heard better shape to look like a brick. My Hungarian at this point could be best described as how to order a glass of wine and say thank you, but I did know how to say I don't speak Hungarian. It is a pretty useful phrase anywhere you go, where you don't speak the language mostly, but especially there. Hungary tends to be more monolingual than most of Europe, so I like to be upfront that we might have some sort of communication problems. Regardless, he started to speak to me. I didn't know what he was saying, so I just sort of vomited words out of my squeakiest voice ever that I didn't speak Hungarian in Magyar. At this point, I was across the street but stopped and trying not to break into a run into the alleyway. Yet because my heart rate was up and it was quite a bit of debris and it lots of people threw trash and such there since it was near a dumpster, I kept one eye on him and one eye on my route through the market alley, which was completely silent, pitch black, and would need a solid one minute run to get to the gas station. He looked at me and said, in stunted English, get in the fucking car. Yeah, nope, that is not happening. I shook my head a little bit and then, almost like a cartoon, he moved and I moved at the same time. We're talking, I was off like a bullet. I ran with the wind bullseye. I'm lazy at the best of times, but somehow I channeled Usain Bolt. I was not hanging around. I cleared one obstacle, jumping over it, but hit a pothole hard on my ankle. As I was running, I had my best friend in Budapest's name highlighted on my phone. I pressed send. When David answered, I was crouched behind some trash cans and hysterical, telling him someone was trying to get me. He didn't really understand, but he told me to stop talking. As he would later admit, he thought I was exaggerating or letting my mind play tricks on me. I could hear the guy looking for me, shouting at his friend, and then cursing in Hungarian. Before kicking something, Dave was whispering into the phone to, 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 to go back to the metro, to go get to the gas station, to call a cab. There was no way I was going to get off the phone with him. He was methodical and calm, which helped me calm down as I waited there, hidden. And then silence. No one was there. His footsteps receded. They gave up. I, I am shaking like a leaf at this point, especially since the fear has started to recede, since I think they are gone. And Dave is pleading with me to hang up, call a cab, and wait for it at the petrol station. But hey, I'm 22. They must have given up on me, right? And I wanted my home. I had to work the next morning. I couldn't wear what I had on to work. I was stupid. I felt calmer with him on the phone. So I stood up and asked him to just stay on the line with me while I walked home. He really disagreed with it, but I told him I'd be fine. As most 22 year old young adults think, I walk out and there's a car. It's moved down the road and the passenger door is open. I realize they think I ran down the alley to pop out somewhere else. Oh no, fuck that. This time Dave is right. I need to get the fuck out of there. And I start hustling backwards hoping they don't see me. Another car comes up behind them and honks impatiently at the guy to move. Reluctantly, I see Wayne Rooney, sorry, the other guy get back into the car, and the two cars roll off at a snail's pace, like they're keeping an eye out. Still, it is a success. I let out a huge sigh, they were gone. Even if they went around to come past the streets again, I would be home, nice and cozy, with a cup of tea before they'd find me. 
I decide the best course of action is just now to go home. Quickly. Dave still thinks I should really head to the station and get a cab and come to him. But I feel like I've beaten it and was sort of buzzing on adrenaline. So I begged him to talk to me. Just talk to me until I got home. As I mentioned, there are two entrances to my building. I turned off the alley that led to the first entrance, rather than walking to go down the main road, which was off to Cyprus, on Cyprus as well. Versus this road, cars can turn and drive down it. Cyprus went to a dead end. I was obviously still really creeped out, but beginning to wonder if maybe I played it up too much and am just being dramatic. To sort of get over how scared I was, I cracked a few jokes with Dave to slow my heartbeat down, all while nearly running home. I cut through the construction and decided to offer using the actual key, rather than my code to open the door, so I had my shoulder holding the phone up while I got my key ready. I figured I'd do this because, though we had a code to unlock the door, you could manually lock the front door, requiring someone to not just have the code, but also have a key to the door. I did not want to be fumbling around that night. I swear to God that the decision saved my life. I would only found out a few days earlier, when I had got back around 3am that you could do that. I had no idea what the key was, until I called Dave in panic on that Saturday about how I was locked out, and even though it was taking my code, I couldn't get inside. He told me to try the keys on my ring, and sure enough, that worked. Funny how that happens, right? That's something a few days earlier, by accident would come to play such an important role. I use my key to unlock my door and as I step inside, chatting amiably with Dave and probably loudly, which was ridiculous, I turn to lock the door behind me just as a hand slams against the glass, trying to catch it before it shut. It was him. I scream so loud that Dave probably also startled and started shouting at what was wrong but in the flurry of horror, I dropped my phone, I panicked. I was sort of running in a circle, because what do you even fucking do? I jammed my key into the door, frantically locking it and praying I wouldn't open it by accident, but wanting another level of security between us. I think I kicked my phone down the corridor, running for the stairs. I just know. I snatched my phone up while the guy pounded on the glass halfway down the hall and nearly fell over from sliding in my heels. I didn't know anyone in the building, and I knew the building was probably half empty at the time, due to it being new and an investment property for a lot of people. I had no idea who was home or, or not home, but I knew I heard the shattering of glass as I dashed the flights. Thankfully, I was only a few floors up, and I didn't hear anything behind me. I opened my door just enough for me to slip inside, so no light would be seen in the window, and pretty much crawled in. I didn't turn on a light. I just locked the door, sat with my back to it, and started to cry. I didn't leave that position until my friend got there. Sure enough, the glass of the door was shattered. But being that it was a key lock, there wasn't anything to turn. So the door wasn't unlocked. Having to go down and unlock the front door for him was the most terrifying walk of my life. I was so scared, the guy was waiting in the building for me to emerge. Down there, seeing the glass, it... It really shook me up. I let him in and I don't think either of us spoke much as we waited for morning. The next day I broke my lease and stayed with a friend until the weekend. When I promptly moved myself and sucked it up and paid the higher rent for a place in the city center. I'll name it after you. Okay, so this isn't my own encounter, but one of my many friends, Isa, has had. The reason for the high amount of creeper activity in her life is her job. She works in a sex shop. Not one of those sweaty, filthy ones with video cabinets and shit, but a classy shop in a good part of town. It even smells nice inside. Isa always explains to people that it's practically the same as a job in a lingerie store or an electric shop. For backstory, we were both 25 years old female at the time. I was going away on vacation. Isa, who lived in a quite a grubby house with seven other students, was very glad to watch my house and my bunnies for me. 
It meant she had a kitchen, bathroom, and toilet all to herself for two whole weeks. Before I caught my train to the airport, I just swung by the sex shop to deliver the keys to my house to Issa. It was a very hot August day. I walked into the shop around noon, an hour before I had to catch my train, because I knew Issa was all alone that day, and I hoped that we could chat a little bit. She cheerfully greeted me and we started talking about the bunnies, my vacation, her upcoming exams, etc. Then a man entered the store. I didn't really pay attention to him because during my visit to Issa's store, I learned that the customers in the sex shop don't like to be looked at for fear of being recognized. So I kept looking at Issa, but her eyes grew big and she grabbed my arm. Come with me to the back for a second, she whispered. She pulled me through the curtain behind the cash register and hissed, this guy always comes in when I'm alone in the shop, and he's such a creep, and I don't want to be alone with him. Will you stay until he's gone? Yeah, sure, I agreed. So when we entered the shop again, I said, Oh, I just want to have a look around, you know, for a present. I decided that I should just stop talking at that point, because however classy the shop is, it still doesn't contain anything I would give to a friend or family member. I positioned myself behind a rack of penis bow ties and feigned interest in them. Meanwhile, I kept an eye on the apparent creeper, he seemed pretty normal to me, late 20s, a little bald, of normal posture. The only thing that was a little off about him was the way his eyes kept darting around the shop, especially in the direction of Issa. After I stood behind the penis bow tie rack for about 10 minutes, and they felt like 10 hours, he started giving me really menacing looks. Neither he, me, nor Issa had said anything in that time, and I was becoming more and more uncomfortable. But... When he started giving the stink eye, it was like he was flashing a neon light with Get out! I want to be alone with her! Unfortunately for him, as one can imagine, I was still really caught up in choosing between a penis bow tie with cow spots or one with shiny blue fabric. Oh, the choices. So, there was simply no way I was getting out of the sex shop before he was sorry. After another long wait, he was finally picked up something and took it to the cash register, where Issa scanned it and told him how much it was. He asked for something under his breath and then paid. I have a hearing problem, so I wasn't able to make out what he was saying. But when he left, I dashed towards the cash desk and asked Issa what he bought. Issa looked horrified. It turned out he had bought a flashlight, you know, one of those things that look like regular flashlights but you can put your penis inside. That fact wasn't creepy at all because, hey, it's a sex shop. Issa sells his stuff to customers every day. But what made it creepy was that he looked at her name tag and asked, Is your name Issa? Yes, she answered reluctantly. What was she gonna do, fucking lie? Can I name this too? He asked and pointed at the flashlight. Sure you can, Issa said. It's yours. Oh, that's great. He giggled. He actually fucking giggled. In that case, I'll name it Issa. Well, he said it. He stroked the flashlight. Ew. Issa decided to get this over with so this douche could get out of the shop. The man paid, winked, and said, Keep the change. And he stalked out of the shop. Issa showed me what he had given her. Inside the Euro notes, he had hidden his card. It contained his name and phone number, plus his profession and the company where he works. In hindsight, he probably was building up to this moment during his previous visits. Because after the I'll name my flashlight Issa incident, he didn't visit the shop again. So he probably was just really socially awkward and shy, but still, ew. So Mr. I'll name my flashlight after you, creeper. I think I can speak on my and on Issa's behalf if I say I hope we don't ever meet again.